We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and welcome to The Meaningful Life. We're available on Apple, Spotify, Podbeam, Amazon Music, and wherever you find your podcasts. It's the time of year when we face two directions. We look back over what has been and forward to what might be. It is the domain of the ancient Roman god Janus, who's always pictured with two heads, one facing backwards and one forwards. He's traditionally the initiator of human life, transformation from one stage to the next and the shift between one era and the next. Believing that two heads are often better than one, I've invited the very first guest on this podcast to help me look back at what I have learned in 2022 and what I want to take forward into 2023. Tracy Cox has been researching, writing and talking about sex for 30 years. She has a podcast, Sex Talk with Tracy and Kelsey, and her books include Hot Sex, Dare, what happens when fantasies come true, and the one we covered on the first ever edition of The Meaningful Life, Great Sex Starts at 50. She's also become a fan and a regular listener to The Meaningful Life, and so I've invited her to look back. I mean, how do you feel at this time of the year, looking back and looking forward? I quite like this time of the year, but that's probably because my family live in Australia, and I know that I'm going to escape this terrible British weather (laughs) and go and get some sunshine. So I associate this time of the year with that. But um, I think I'm a a person that is constantly looking back and reflecting and thinking about where I'm at and where to go next and where I've been. So I don't necessarily just do it at this time of the year. And how good are you at actually sticking with your ideas of, you know, I mean, I have a New Year's resolution that I'm going to become more interested and start looking into Zen Buddhism. That's sort of my New Year's resolution. There's a a Zen Buddhism centre down the road for me in Berlin, and I'm Mm. going to sort of walk through the door for the first time. Fabulous. So that's my resolution for the year. When you actually make resolutions, are you any good at sticking to them? (laughs) <laughs> I tend not to make resolutions, probably because I was addicted to cigarettes for years and every year it would be the same resolution to give up smoking. And I failed, but I, I've been off them for 10 years, thank God. So I tend not to make resolutions, really. Do I stick to things? I'm a bit of a flitter, actually, and your podcast is responsible for that because you know when somebody puts an argument so well and you think, that is how I'm going to be, I'm just going to be this fantastic person and not judgmental. Being less judgmental is probably one of my New Year's resolutions. I'm very judgmental and my face shows it. And it's really annoying because people can see when I'm being judgmental, even when I'm trying desperately hard not to show it. But yeah, so, you know, you, you, somebody puts something perfectly and I think, wow, that is totally the answer to this problem. And then I'll listen to another podcast and the other guest will be just as persuasive. And, and you think, no, 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 that's the way to approach it. So thankfully for me, most of the guests that you have on your podcast are pretty similar in the way they, they kind of think the same way, I think. Would you agree? Yeah, there's a couple of ideas that get repeated over and over again. In fact, one of them I'm going to sort of highlight. And it could just be that that's the way I choose things, or maybe there are some sort of prime ideas to hold on to. And universal truths. Yeah, I think there are. They're obviously going to be different for each person, but I would like to think that there is a, a general idea behind this podcast, which I think is how important it is to look deeper, how important it is to reflect, and also to try and see a different perspective. Because particularly in relationships, we can get stuck in our own idea. And our idea is so strong, we can't actually see the other person's idea, which to them is equally strong. Exactly. Well, it is what you say, what what gives your life meaning, the meaningful life. And, And if you live life on the surface, your life has no meaning. I mean, congratulations on the podcast. It is absolutely fantastic. 
Mine is very different. It's very practical and, you know, in its solving of three different problems every single time. Whenever somebody says to me, you know, what podcast do you really want to do? And I said, I want to do Andrew's podcast. (laughs) I want to be the one talking to all these interesting, fabulous people rather than solving sex problems. I would do a swap. You can solve the sex problems. And I'm going to come and talk to all these fabulous people. Well, that is a very tempting idea that uh, <laughs> if I'm ever I'm away, I can we can have the meaningful life with Tracy Cox and I'll do the sex problems once. That could be a fun swap. I reckon that's the deal. Okay, well, let's actually have my first choice, which in fact, actually, we sort of both chose the same guest. And that is Terry Real. Terry is a family therapist, the founder of the Relational Life Institute and a senior faculty member of the Family Institute of Cambridge in Massachusetts and a retired clinical fellow of the Meadows Institute in Arizona. We spoke about his new book, us getting past you and me to build a more loving relationship. And this is very much about trying to understand that your partner has just as uh, vibrant and um, compelling version of events as you'd have. What stops you getting to us? Well, there are five losing strategies in relationship that stop you from getting there. And here they are. These are losing strategies. This is what your adaptive child part will gravitate toward. And I ask the the listeners to do a little soul searching as you're listening right now and ask yourself, where do I go? What strategy or combination of strategies is my knee-jerk response when I'm stressed? Okay, so number one. Being right. We are going to solve this problem by determining which of us is correct. (laughs) Good luck. Number two, we're laughing because we recognize these so much. Number two. (laughs) Controlling your partner. I would be happy if only you would, dot, dot, dot. Good luck on that one, too. (laughs) Number three. Unbridled self-expression, ventilating. Let me tell you just how miserable I am at what you just did and what you did a week ago and two weeks ago and 10 years ago and blah, 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 And let me tell you three times just in case you didn't hear on the other two versions. (laughs) And let me make it louder each time I speak. That's unbridled self-expression. Number four. Retaliation, which I have a warm spot in my heart for. (laughs) Well, my... My wife, Belinda, also a family therapist, has a beautiful frame for the human impulse of retaliation. She says it's a perverse wish for healing. Mm. It's a perverse wish for community. Let me hurt you the way you hurt me so you'll understand what you did to me. But, of course, punishing someone will never increase their empathy. It's a loser. And then the last losing strategy is shutting down or withdrawal. So let's be honest, which is yours? Because even marital therapists and family therapists have old wounds and have old strategies. What's yours? I, uh, of course, uh, you must understand I'm in my wife's adult 364 days out of the year. But <laughs> that, uh, January 23rd, I think I lost it. And uh, <laughs> no, that's not true. Anyway, when I lose, I move toward control and retaliation. I, you see, I have love uh, addiction parts. I can be a boundaryless and love dependent and grandiose. So I would be happy if only you were more loving. And this is how you should be more loving and God help you if you're not. That's me on a bad day. So what is your losing strategy of choice, Tracy? I'd say exactly the same as his, actually. You can see why I was wrestling you for him. He's just so the most likable and interesting speaker. I'm controlling partner and disappearing. I probably disappear when I'm really angry, which I don't, I'm not convinced that isn't a bad thing, just for a little while, 20 minutes or so. And then the controlling thing is very much my way of doing life, really. And it's interesting that when I was doing my favorites for this, a lot of the stuff that had resonated the most with me was about control. Right. So there you go. Definitely ticking that box. Well, I'm disappearing as well. And I agree with you. There's nothing wrong with disappearing for 20 minutes or so, particularly if you're going to shout and scream at your partner in those 20 minutes. Mm. But I think what he's talking about is actually closing down the topic altogether rather than just taking a break on it. And I think the thing that I've taken away from this, 
And I don't know if my clients are going to be very pleased with this, but whereas beforehand I would sit there quite patiently while people had a game of I'm right and you're wrong, you know, hoping that maybe we might find a compromise through I'm right and you're wrong. I have no patience for it now. I say, hang on, this is a game of I'm right and you're wrong and it's leading Mm. us nowhere. So let's stop now. So I've got far less patience with that. <laughs> I, I hate the I'm right and you're wrong, even though we all do it, let's face it. But it really doesn't get you anywhere at all. Who cares? Who really cares? I mean, I remember in one of my previous relationships going to see a counsellor and seriously, it was doomed from the start because all I was worried, all I wanted out of that session was you're right. That's all I wanted. And she didn't say that, funnily enough. And so that was that, really. It was like, well, that didn't work to my advantage. So, you know, we won't be going to see her again. So, yeah, I think you're dead right in doing that with your patients. Yeah, I've been doing it for 35 years and nobody has ever turned around to their partner and said, do you know, actually, you put that so well, you're right. And I've actually made a big mistake. (laughs) Never. No, because it's never going to happen, is it? Okay, so that was Terry Real. What's the first one you've chosen for us, Tracy? Okay, so my first person was Dr. Frederick Luskin, and it was all about forgiveness. So Fred is the director of the Stanford University Forgiveness Project and a professor for transpersonal psychology. So what appealed to you about Fred? Well, I think forgiveness is a very interesting topic. And what I loved about Fred, Frederick Luskin, was because, you know, he just challenges everything that we believe about forgiveness, that lots of people think it means letting people get away with what they did, or condoning what they did, or justifying what they did. But, you know, as he points out, hanging on to hate is a true way to make your life absolutely miserable. So the person who hurts you has actually won. And he got into it because he was miserable, because his best friend had betrayed him. And it just sucked the life out of him, he said. And he became more and more and more miserable until I think his wife said, oh, for God's sake, just go and fix it, you know, just go and sort it out. And he did, and he forgave, and then they became the best of friends again. And he just challenges all of our set views about what it means to forgive, that, you know, forgiveness is about our healing. It's nothing to do with them. And I loved that he talked about how forgiveness isn't about letting them off the hook or that they don't even have to know that you've forgiven them. And he talks about how the problem with not forgiving is that, and these are his words, not mine, it's such an antagonist. We don't realise how warped our perspective is when we see through anger and self-pity and how this influences all our decisions. And I just loved that take on it. And I particularly loved this take where he addresses the point that forgiveness doesn't excuse bad behaviour. Forgiveness, it's a powerful, positive strength that human beings can bring to things. And another thing that people say to me who don't want to forgive somebody, and I never try and push somebody to forgive somebody, but um, this is something they say over and over again, it will excuse poor behavior. Why isn't it not excusing poor behavior if you forgive somebody? It doesn't necessarily the behavior, they don't even have to know that you've forgiven or not. So if there's a hit and run driver and they do something that harms somebody and, you know, if you choose to forgive it, you may never see that person again. I found that because I somehow in my head, forgiveness is all about having a meeting with that person and saying it to their face. And it just didn't even occur to me that you could forgive and not ever have anything more to do with them. And I I just really love that. And he says, you know, forgiveness is if one person has an affair and you say to the other person, you're your spouse, yes, I forgive you for having the affair, but I don't want to continue with this relationship. So you always think if you forgive an affair, it means you're going to stay with them. Well, it doesn't. And um, he also, along the the same vein, talked about whether forgiving means there's no consequences, because that's the other thing about forgiveness. And the other thing that I find that people have against forgiveness is that they think that if they forgive, it means there's been no consequences for the other person, that somehow if they've treated you badly, there has to be consequences. Well, that's the ages old human dilemma of whether or not to take revenge and try to make somebody else suffer because you suffered. 
And so what you're really looking at is not necessarily forgiveness, but a, a, a person's inner dilemma about how much payback they want to do. The issue with that is you probably want more to differentiate forgiveness with justice, which yes. is you can, you can forgive somebody fully and still take them to court. I just love that last line. You can forgive somebody fully, but just still take them to court. I thought that was absolutely fantastic. And his voice, I love a New Yorker. I love a New Yorker. So I could just, that you had me at the voice with that one. It was just, I could listen to him talk all day long. So I just loved the lessons. I, I really did get a lot out of that in terms of forgiveness. It's interesting, the difference between being forgiving and actually judging and yes. actually setting yourself up as the judge and, you know, as having the power of the gods to decide what is right or wrong. So there's a sort of a philosophical depth to that as well that I think is interesting. Mm. Now, at the beginning, we sort of talked about whether there was sort of running ideas. And I think that one of the ideas was first introduced by Kathleen Smith. Dr. Kathleen Smith is a licensed therapist from Washington and the author of the book, Everything Isn't Terrible, Conquer Your Insecurities, Interrupt Your Anxiety and Finally Calm Down. And this idea of interrupting your feelings, I'll explain a bit more in a second, I think is really key to leading a more meaningful life and a better life. So let's see what she means by interrupting anxiety. Well, I think perhaps a better way of explaining it is interrupting how you bind up anxiety or how you manage anxiety, you know, interrupting what's automatic. And that requires putting up with a, a fair amount of distress <laughs> when all of a sudden you're not doing what you normally do, right? Uh, people want to feel calm. They want to feel confident. They want that right away. Right. But people need to be aware that anytime you're doing something you normally wouldn't do, every piece of your body is going to go. <laughs> and and maybe your family, too, is going to go. Who are you? Change back. Please stop. <laughs> you know, I had, a, I had a client I worked with recently who was getting in touch with a family member she hadn't spoken to for a very long time. They had been estranged. And, you know, she expected to feel so good about it, but every piece of her was saying no, you know, because other people weren't doing this. How they had kept things stable for decades was to not speak, right? So to all of a sudden do something differently, you are not going to feel calm, <laughs> at least not in the short term when you begin to move towards somebody. And I think recognizing that is important for people so they don't go, wait, maybe I shouldn't do this because now I'm distressed all of a sudden. Yeah. And I think that's what keeps people trapped, isn't it? They try something else and they expect it to be better, but actually there's going to be a natural moment or maybe a while when you're going to actually feel more anxious. You're going to feel more of everything before you can come out the other side. And that is sort of terrifying, really, isn't it? Yes. And you may always will feel a little bit of it. You know, if you're, you were human, we want people to like us and <laughs> we want to get along with each other and we want to keep things calm. So, you know, there may always be a piece of the anxiety. And I think that goes back to how do you measure success? You know, is it feeling anxiety free or is it putting your best thinking into, into action and how you live your life? And that may mean that there's a <laughs> a little more distress in certain arenas than there, than there was before. But I think overall, People do calm down over time and they are less reactive, you know, the, the more of their, their thoughtfulness they can bring to their relationships. So what I call this interrupting is the golden gap. So I'll give you a personal example. I've moved from the UK to Germany and I sort of understood how England works because, you know, I was born there, I'd lived there all my life. And so I was able to sort of manage my anxiety because I sort of understood the system. Here in Germany, the letters come in German, surprisingly enough, and <laughs> I don't understand the system. And they're asking you for things that I'm not really, I don't follow. And so a letter will come in German and my natural reaction is to become anxious. Oh my God, what are they going to ask me? And, you know, my mind spirals off. 
Mm-hmm. And this is what happens a lot is we get the stimulus, you know, the letter arrives in the post. And before you even realise it, you have, you know, your emotional train has left the station. And already you're panicking and you're worrying and you're already deep into your automatic reaction, which in my case is panic. Um, other people might get angry or they might go into poor me or whatever. So the whole idea of the golden gap is that there is a moment <laughs> between seeing, oh my gosh, it's a letter from uh, the Krankenkasse, that's the health insurance, which is an incredibly complicated thing. They're forever asking you for all sorts of things. And then me going off on the actual automatic reaction. And it's only a tiny little second, but if I can actually, as she says, interrupt it or step into that gap, then I can actually choose how I'm going to respond rather than go straight off into the automatic reaction. And it's the same, you know, our partner says something upsetting like, you've left, this is one, this is another personal one, you've left your shoes for me to trip over again. And I can immediately get into defensive mode and, you know, I'm trying my best not to do it. And, you know, I was in a hurry and all of those other kind of things. And before I say it, I'm into my automatic defences. And if I can just put in that golden gap, that moment, I can choose what I'm going to do. I can have the fight about the shoes or I could decide, actually, it's probably not worth it. And I'll just say, I'm sorry. So what do you I'll... do in the gap? What do you do in the gap? What do you say to yourself? Well, first and foremost is you have to accept that there is a golden gap and that you can step into it. And the first one you do is I think you register what your feelings are. So, you know, I'm feeling defensive or I'm feeling angry or I'm feeling misunderstood or whatever it is. So you try and identify the feeling. You try and see, I mean, I'm this one is I'm giving you as a small example, but normally it's a big one. So you've actually got big feelings in your body. Where are they? And that helps you ground yourself a little bit. You know, are they in your chest? Are they in your fingers? Are you got a are you feeling a pressure across your shoulders? That helps. You take a breath, and by now we've probably had two seconds have gone by. And that is a lot big enough for you to actually step into it and perhaps do a, you know, a a really nice deep breath. And generally, I would reflect back at this point. And the reason you do this, it gives you a bit of thinking time. So, um, So reflecting back in this occasion would be, you're upset that I've left my shoes in the hallway. And you'll probably get a reiteration of why it's upsetting. By this point, you've got probably about 20 seconds to actually think what you're going to do. And, you know, it could be that you're going to have the row. That's fine. But you've chosen the row. Or you could decide to step aside from it and say, I'm sorry. and move the shoes. So that's the golden gap. And it's not just anxiety, it's every feeling going. And it's something that quite a lot of my guests actually talk about, that we are so used to those automatic reactions, like going back into one of Terry's five failing things, stepping away, you know, ventilating. And that gap allows you to choose. Mm. And that is very powerful. I agree. I think that that this is one of those universal truths that seems to shine through, doesn't it? And what else is something that I've noticed with all the people that you interview is breathing. And I only understood about breathing probably, gosh, five years, 10, no, maybe 10 years ago. And what a difference. I hold my breath all the time without meaning to. and, And especially when you're angry, I really do hold my breath in it. And if you just take one breath, one deep breath, it is enough for the brain, which is an extraordinary, you know, it's it's capable of so much thought in a nanosecond, isn't it? It is exactly what you said. That little tiny gap is enough to reset and think, do I really want to tell my stepdaughter that she's so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so? Maybe not. Maybe I won't say that. And, you know, and it, it can save you from so many things just taking that one deep breath. And you can report your feelings rather than act them out. So acting out Hmm. is is sort of full body language. You're the body language expert. How do you act out anger? Well, you become big and, you know, your face, my face when I'm angry frightens me. If I go into the bathroom when I'm angry and have a look, I'm like, oh my God, look at you. My eyes become dark. We make very big gestures when we're angry. We puff ourselves up. 
and, um, you know, to make ourselves look as, as threatening as possible. And that's not very nice to be on the end of. So, and then of course, the person that you're doing that to adopts the same body language to fight back in a sense. And, and you're off on a big, you know, very unhelpful spiral of, of anger and argument. So, um, yeah, I listened to that podcast and I thought it was very good as well. So you can still have the feelings, but I'd like you to report them. So I'm feeling angry when you, so it's not all the time. So we've got a specific thing that your stepdaughter has done. And then Mm. because, because sometimes they think you're upset about the shoes because it's thoughtlessness, whereas it could be that it's actually they actually did fall over them with a shopping bag and they nearly broke stuff. So you actually know the reason they're angry and it's kept down to a specific time. I'm not angry with you full stop, which is sometimes Mm. how it can be heard. I'm angry with you when you leave your shoes in the hallway. We don't have very much room in a German flat, which is why (laughs) leaving my shoes is such a problem. I went to Berlin recently, actually. I was just there for a weekend. It was freezing for number one. I loved it. But yeah, my my, um, godson lives there and his flat was very small. I was like, wow, okay. Yeah, they are tiny. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits how can i help you have a better relationship there's nothing i like better than talking to some of the world's top sex and relationship experts it helps me learn and grow and that's why i've started this podcast but what makes my life meaningful is writing and teaching That's why I've written 20 books on relationships, which have been translated into 20 languages. They fall into two categories. Firstly, improve your relationships. In this category, I'd like to recommend Happy Couple Handbook, powerful love hacks for a successful relationship. I cover constructive arguing, be a better listener, use carrots rather than sticks, and how to forgive and move on. In the second category, which is called Rescue Your Relationship. I have books like I Love You But I'm Not In Love With You, my international bestseller, Can We Start Again? 50 Questions to Fall Back In Love, My Wife Doesn't Love Me Anymore, and My Husband Doesn't Love Me Anymore and He's Texting Someone Else. You can find out more about these books, along with details about how to get involved with the show and send in your question to be discussed with my guests at my website, www.andrewgmarshall.com. So let's move on to the next thing you learnt. Okay, my next choice was Tom Rutledge, which was all about embracing fear in four steps. Tom is a psychotherapist and leader of recovery retreats. And the book that he was talking about was Embracing Fear and How to Turn What Scares Us into Your Greatest Gifts. What I loved about this podcast, Andrew, is because he doesn't, as the book title suggests, he doesn't talk about beating fear. He talks about living with it, which is a very sort of interesting concept because we all want to get rid of fear, but we can't. And to be honest, that whole podcast was just littered with so many useful pieces of advice that you want to stick on the mirror. Things like he says, fear and shame are two sides of the same coin. And that anger is just energy, which I thought was extraordinary way of looking at anger. And your comment actually um, to that, Andrew, was that anger is standing in for fear in lots of cases. But I particularly like the bit where he talks about fear and change and how people are very much, you know, well, this is just me. You know, you've you've stuck with me. This is just the way I am. And nothing infuriates me more when people say things like that, because we are capable of change. And I think that he put it very beautifully when he talked about, you know, we might not be in control, but we are in charge. We just kind of assume that we are what we are. And hopefully what we do with this process, even this conversation, is we introduce the ideas like, no, you, you know, you get to choose. You know, one of the big, the big ways of making change is to understand that we, we're not in control of a lot. I figured I'm almost 68 years old. I figured out that much so far. 
<laughs> I don't control a lot. When we look at the serenity prayer, what we control into, I don't control much, but we are in charge. And that's, that's the message that, that, that brings all of the possibility to life here. It's a corny analogy, but I, you know, I don't have anything to do with how the cards are dealt, but I can become a good card player. This is another thing that I think is a, is a theme that runs through is we can't change history. You know, we can't change what's influenced us. It's happened. It's here, but we can change how we react to it. And I think that that is something that gets echoed over and over again. And, and I, I, what else I liked about him was, he says he has self-hatred, and I quite like it when all these very sorted people come on and say, well, yeah, I'm saying all this, and I sound fantastic, but in fact, I still have those little moments, you know, where I hate myself. And this wonderful thing, which actually I should have picked as my second clip, but there was so much to choose from with him. And he makes a comment about our inner bullies, and he says, you know, you might think your sibling or your mother or father knows exactly how to wind you up, but no one is as good as winding you up as you are your Yourself. And I just love that. But I chose this other clip instead because he talks about how to deal with your demons. And what he says is the exact opposite to what you instinctively want to do. Always move towards your demons. They take their power from your retreat. Oh, I like that. Please repeat it because I like okay. that. They always move towards your demons. They take their power from your retreat. And one of the things I do to, to, to demonstrate that is I, I would, if we were sitting in the same room, I would have you stand in front of me, like put your hands on your hips, just take a position of power. You don't have to say anything. Just want you to be in that spot. Yeah, there you go. And then I'm going to sit down lower than you. And then as you just stand there, you don't move at all. I'm going to cringe farther and farther down. I'm going to become, you know, talk about my voice on this week, weaker and weaker and weaker. It's like, and what I'm demonstrating to the audiences there, if I'm there in a workshop, is that you don't change at all at that point. I am giving my power away by running, by, by retreating. And that sort of buys into the whole, you know, stand up for yourself business, isn't it? You know, if you're going to run away the whole of your life, you're probably not going to get very far. So I, I just really, I loved all of his concepts were, again, very practical, and I like a bit of practical, and and things that you could, you know, the opposite our instinct is to run because of the, you know, fight and flight. Yeah, fight and flight, which is a very instinctive thing. But, you know, it's, it really isn't going to get you anywhere running away. Yes, I think the idea of learning from your fears and actually getting a gift, something I say to my clients, you know, accept the fear and see what it's got to give you. You know, what's it asking from you? What's its message? Because nine times out of 10, fear has got a message for us. Yes, it has. It's trying to protect you, isn't it? So there is, I mean, what did he say about the flip side to everything? And, and you know, in life, there is always a flip side. Like, I'm, yes, I'm a control freak, but that's also helpful professionally if you're a control freak because you're always on top of things. So, of course, your body doesn't make you create an emotion without some kind of reason behind it. And it's generally protection, isn't it? Not that it's particularly helpful all the time, the emotions that it creates. Yeah, I thought if you if you do suffer from anxiety and fear, I think he's a, a must listen. Absolutely. So let's look at the third of my guests. And this is Dr. Matthew McKay, who's a clinical psychologist, a couples therapist, and a professor of psychology at the Wright Institute. I spoke to him about his book, Love in the Time of Impermanence. And the bit that I've chosen comes from the bonus section. I suppose this is a, a moment to suggest that you become supporters of The Meaningful Life or subscribe directly through Apple or Spotify, because the conversation always continues afterwards. And sometimes the pieces that uh, actually often end up being the most powerful are in the bonus material. So, he talked about navigation tools. And this is an idea I've beginning to use more and more myself. And here he is talking about navigation tools. Navigation principle is what we do when we come to every moment of choice in our lives. Our lives are, are filled with choice and, and moments of choice. It's not like just the big choice, like, well, you know, what am I going to do for my career? Or who am I, who am I going to partner with? And, uh, you know, but actually, every day, our lives are made up of choices and moments in which we make those choices, and they end up creating the fabric of our life, of our existence. And moments of choice are, are particularly present or obvious when there's a, an intense emotion, when there's a feeling 
of desire, a strong feeling of desire, or when we are in pain of some kind. Those are often moments of choice where we can act on the desire, on the pain, on the pain, on the emotion, or we could act on love. And so that's what the work is. So I think it helps to understand the whole idea of these navigation principles if I pull out from his book seven of the the most common ones that how people navigate. So the first one is avoiding pain. We often choose the path of avoiding rather than allowing it. And obviously, we have to think about what's the impact of forever living, trying to avoid pain when we come to a difficult choice. And sometimes these are just actually in the the moment of that fight about the shoes in the in the hallway you know i want to avoid the pain so i fight it whereas in fact it might be better to accept the pain and uh, discuss the whole issue of shoes and where we put things the second one is going for pleasure and i think uh, a lot of people choose always going for the pleasurable option and unfortunately they don't always see that the pleasure sometimes has pain involved in it as well. You know, the night out might be pleasurable, but it also involves possibly pain from, you know, what happens after three o'clock in the, in the morning when, you know, the things you say that you, you wish you hadn't said or how you feel the next morning. But if you're always looking for pleasure as your navigating principle, then you're not going to register the pain so much. Then we have navigating by desire for power or control. I'm smiling, Tracy. Yeah, all of our politicians. Yes. We can navigate for wealth. You know, we're going to do the thing that's going to bring us in money. Or we can navigate for the familiar and the safe. I'm I'm afraid to say that is one of my ones, you know, that I would much rather keep safe and stay with the familiar. I think most people would, wouldn't they? I think we all have to tick that box a bit. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes I actually tell myself, you know, I came to Berlin to learn and grow and to try new things. And so, for example, I went to a conference where there was a workshop on burial rituals. And we were going to do a ritual where we were going to ritually bury people. And that involves taking their clothes off them, washing the bodies, anointing them with oil, uh, wrapping them in in a in a what you call a a shroud that's the oh, word yeah, i'm yeah. looking for and then carrying them to the ancestral burial grounds which in this case was a pile of mattresses and every instinct in my body said no don't do this workshop and an equal set said you really need to do this workshop and in the end you know i navigated not through the familiar and the safe, which would have said, don't do the workshop. But, you know, I thought I came to Berlin to try new things. And, you know, you have ritual burial workshops here in the way that, uh, you know, I've never come across a ritual burial workshop before. Um, And it was incredibly powerful. But that was an example of how I've stopped trying to navigate through the familiar and I've gone for growth as my one. The next one is setting a course for ego, what enhances our prestige and our personal value. And then the next one is our emotions. I mean, the first six sound not good and the last one sounds better, but what's the correct, what's the tick tick? We should all be doing this. Well, I think everybody's got to do something different. I mean, he says we should navigate through love. You know, what would be the loving thing to do? So, you know, the loving thing to do, bearing in mind my partner is really upset about me leaving my shoes in the hall. Actually, if I was navigating through love, I would say I'm terribly sorry and put my shoes away and actually make a great effort not to leave my shoes lying around. That's what I would do if I was navigating from love. But I don't think there's any right or wrong way of navigating. You know, there are times when you you do need to navigate for, you know, ego. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, I was about you to know. say, you have to have a little bit of each one, don't you? Like if you were navigating for love and you didn't really want to go to the ritual burial workshop – and then you would say, you could say, well, I'm going to look after Andrew and not make him do something he doesn't want to do. Couldn't you? So it's yeah. hard, that one. Interesting yeah. though, to look at it all spelt out because everything is, is navigated by those things, isn't it? We are all driven by those things and not all of them, well, not very many of them are, are very nice, are they? And I think there's a difference between love and 
wanting to be loved. So, you know, I'm doing this because I'm going to try and make you love me is very different from what would I do if I was full of love in this situation for you. A lot of these things we actually do, and these are the th- automatic things. I think if you can get into the golden gap, you can begin to actually stop and think, you know, what is my navigation principle? What What is the one, you know, my gut one, which is the familiar and safe? And, you know, actually, I might want to change that. That's something that can be done in the golden gap. So let's look at your next offering. My next choice was Dr. Cheryl Fraser, How to Stay in Love. She's a Buddhist sex therapist, so you had me just with that, Andrew. I mean, how could you not love that combination? And I loved her positivity. I loved the story of her life. And she spent her whole life trying to work out why we aren't better at love and why love that lasts a lifetime isn't easier. And I particularly like this because of what what I do in my work is I'm so, and you must be so sick of this too, Andrew, when people say, but I love him or I love her. Like that explains everything. Like I'm with this person who's, you know, beating the crap out of me every day, but he loves me. It's fine. You know, or I'm with this woman who treats me like, you know, something on the bottom of my shoe, but she loves me. It's all done from love. And it's like, that's not love. We use love as an excuse so many times and it really gets me riled. Cheryl doesn't sort of talk about this. She talks about how, in some ways, I think love is the least important thing to make a relationship where respect, kindness, compatibility, liking your partner are just as important. So she talks about how important all those things are, even more important than love. And that's certainly what I agree with as well. I like the point she made that happiness is an inside job. I'm always fascinated by anything about how, what makes people happy. And, and she says, you know, whether or not we're happy isn't based on life events or what's happening to people around us. It's up to us. And she tells that story to you, Andrew, about if you walk outside and her car's been vandalized, she could come back in and just go completely bonkers and have a terrible week and rant about, you know, how awful society has become. Or she could come in and say, well, I'm insured and, you know, that's a good job. I've got insurance and a day would be fine. So I, th- I really like that. I particularly liked she talks about, which is another big beef of mine. Everyone talks about, well, it's not like it was in relationships. Why can't it be like it was in the beginning? Well, in the beginning, you put so much effort into the relationship. And as the relationship goes on, we put less and less effort. And gosh, what happens is that the relationship isn't as good. And yet people are so, oh, no, no, no. It just happened automatically in the beginning. And it absolutely drives me insane. But the thing, so so much I loved about this one, but the thing I loved the best was a statistic that she quotes. And I have quoted it so many times since then. And it buys into my whole concept of the book that I've written about sex after 50, but the whole concept of long-term sex and how we get it completely wrong. And she puts this beautifully. And of course, the sensuality very much includes sexuality, all aspects of our erotic life. Do we kiss goodnight with tongue? Do we have a passionate kiss goodnight, even when we don't intend it to move into any sort of lovemaking? But those little moments that remind you and I that we are ideally still a passionate couple, whether we make love once a day or once a quarter, but that that is a sacred neglected part of long-term love for the majority of couples, our sexual life. And I'll just put out a statistic here that is so important. I try to put it out every time I'm interviewed or write anything. The research is pretty clear that around 30%, some studies it's higher, of long-term couples. And now we're defining long-term couples as together more than, say, two years. We're not just talking about people who've been together for decades. 30% or higher of long-term couples are in a sexless relationship, which is clinically defined as you make love six or fewer times a year. In other words, it's highly normal to be not having sex. And of that 30, sometimes 40% who are clinically sexless, they might make love six times a year, but the majority of them don't make love at all with each other. Now, people assume that 
it is the norm to keep wanting to have hot, passionate sex with your partner. And it really isn't. And I found that extraordinary that actually 30% of people two years on. So, so I found that completely reassuring for couples, like give yourself a pat on the back, even if you are having sex. And the other thing that she explores is this concept of responsive versus spontaneous desire in a relationship, which if everybody could get their head around this, there would be less complaining about sex in a relationship because spontaneous desire happens at the beginning of a relationship. And it's that I I see you and I want to have sex with you. It's like looking at something and suddenly all the hormones are going wild and you want to have sex. We all love that. That's the model that they put in TVs and movies. And it's the one that everybody thinks is great sex. This is our definition. Why can't I feel like that all the time? What happens in a long-term relationship is responsive desire, which is that you start feeling like sex once you're being stimulated. And she talks about the majority of long-term couples start having sex from a place of sexual neutrality. In other words, most long-term couples, when they start having sex with each other, don't even feel like sex. They start feeling like sex and they have perfectly nice, great, satisfying sex once they keep going because they're good at stimulating each other. And then suddenly they're having great orgasms and they've thoroughly enjoyed the session. But if we can move past this whole thing that we've got to be madly turned on and frothing at the mouth to have sex, to begin the sex session, which is not going to happen once you're past that 18 months bit, and that you have to plan sex and you have to go, right, we're going to, you know, we're going to have sex now, whether we like it or not basically, and then start stimulating each other. And then surprise, surprise, all of a sudden you really turned on and aroused and you've had great sex. If we could all do this, life would be much better for long-term couples. And this is what um, Cheryl talks about, you know, throughout the podcast, which is something that I feel really strongly about. And she does put it beautifully in here. And I agree with you 100%. And I think that us men are more than 50% to blame because unfortunately in man world, there is a secret decree, which is in fact complete and utter nonsense, which is there has to be an erect penis in the room before you're allowed to have sex. And so that means that men actually don't come over to your side of the bed unless they are 100% certain they're going to deliver an erect penis. And the idea that an erect penis is the only thing that's going to give women pleasure is one of the greatest sources of misery in absolutely going because you've got fingers and tongues. And as you say, once you're in the zone, what I call the sort of sensual kind of place where you're enjoying each other's warmth and the stroking, and it doesn't even really have to be stimulation. It can be very much more diffused than, you know, going straight to the genitals, which I think you're going to tell me is a a bit of a bad idea anyway. (laughs) Work from the outside inwards, guys. Yes. And the whole erect penis thing, I mean, that's the other myth that seems to, I mean, I've been talking about this for 30 odd years. Women have their orgasms through clitoral stimulation. The clitoris is outside the vagina. Intercourse and thrusting is woefully ineffective at stimulating the clitoris. So it's 80% of women do not have their orgasms through intercourse. So the erect penis is really, you could, you could have great sex without an erect penis. You, You could, for the rest of your life, you could. You know, it might feel good, penetrative sex, but in terms of making a woman climax, it, it's not relevant, really. And the message to women is how erect your partner's penis is, is not a judgment on you. Yes. I think it's very easy to think erect penis, I'm gorgeous. No erection, I'm ugly. Yes. Whereas in fact, it could be just that he's yet to get into the zone. It could be he's tired. It could be that he actually is in a sensual place rather than a sexual place. Mm. And you can have great fun in a sensual place. That's right. And and the whole, I mean, I feel really sorry for men and I've never understood penis envy because I would hate to have a penis because it's right there on show, isn't it? You know, and there is, and women are just as bad as men in that, like, you're right. It, it's like, well, how, how come you're not standing to attention? Am I too fat? But, you know, is this for it? My boob's not big enough. And we go into this big spiral and this whole concept that arousal equals erect penis or, you know, lubricated vagina, they're both completely affected by so many other factors. It's not even funny. I mean, we're humans. We, you know, we're not robots. If you want an erect penis, just buy a sex toy. That will never let you down. (laughs) (laughs) Um, We're going to actually continue this conversation about sex because um, the next person that I've chosen 
is Irene Fair, who's a sex and intimacy specialist. Unfortunately, that is where we've run out of time for the main podcast, but it could may be that this year is the year you're going to become a, a supporter of The Meaningful Life. And if you want to hear Trace's two other choices, my two other choices, and a continuation of our discussion about sex in long-term relationships, then you need to find out about the bonus material. You can subscribe directly via Apple or Spotify. We're also available on Amazon Music. And if you want to become a supporter of The Meaningful Life, here are the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.